Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this, the final presentation for the AE-420 uh, preliminary aircraft design. And so uh, we were waiting for one more evaluator, but if they come in, that's fine. We'll, we'll go ahead and go. Uh, but the three groups that you have today, we're going to, uh, we have three different airplanes. We've got the northern airplane, which we'll see first, which is a Bush airplane. Uh, that's supposed to take things and people to northern locations and be able to land just anywhere. And we've got two fighter interceptor groups that you'll see uh, from there. And but before we get started, I'd like to have our panel uh, introduce themselves. Good morning, I'm, uh, I'm Professor Bill Zwick at uh, Edgar Riddle. Martin Martinez, CSA Corporation, small company out of Tempe. Trying to stay up here in Prescott because this is a really cool place. <laughs> I'm really honored to, to be here to evaluate uh, what you guys are doing. I think this is really great. My company specializes in product development. We're rather small, but we pretty much support everyone and anyone. Uh, you're talking Honeywell, Raytheon, you name it. We've worked on it. So, got a lot of experience. I throw a lot of rocks at you guys do. So, we'll take it from personal. It's student constructive. But I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. These guys deflect rocks pretty well. Good. <laughs> That's what we want to see. <laughs> okay, so uh, without anything further, we'll uh, let the group talk to you about this fantastic Bush airplane that they have developed. Good morning. My name is Chad Burge. I'm the design team lead for Northern Elements. Today we will be discussing the preliminary design of our Northern Utility aircraft, named the Any One Frontier. Throughout the duration of this presentation, the screen above me will be referred to as the primary screen, and the screen to my side will be referred to as a secondary screen. This is Northern Elements Any One Frontier. The Frontier is a multi-surface amphibious flying boat. This means that the fuselage acts as a hole during water operations. Notice on the primary screen that the landing gear is retracting into the sponsons, which are airfoil shaped and provide stability and buoyancy on the water. Also notice that the engines are mounted above the wing. This provides adequate prop tip clearance when landing on unimproved surfaces as well as when floating on the water. Lastly, notice that the windshield is partitioned and the passenger windows are rounded. This is a result of the Frontier being a pressurized aircraft. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my team, which consists of Jared Johnson, Mark Van Bergen, Nick Kearney, James Bangor, Sergio Perez, Blake Bradford, and Alexander Vladika. The secondary screen shows an overview of this presentation, showing we will start with the motivation for the Frontier, followed by a series of design decisions, and we will finish with conclusions and recommendations. Jared Johnson will now discuss the motivation behind the Anyone Frontier. Thank you, Chad. I'm Jared Johnson, and I'm going to be discussing the motivation behind the design of Northern Elements Any One Frontier. There are 201 communities in Alaska that currently do not have direct access to medical facilities or regular resupply routes. 25 of these communities do not have runway. This accounts for roughly 10% of Alaska's overall population, and the rest of the state relies heavily on the infrastructure. On the primary screen behind me, you can see Alaska's 11 state roads, found almost exclusively on the east side of the state. Less than 5% of these roads were deemed in very good condition by the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, while the rest have been deteriorated by year-round icing and flooding. The frontier will be able to reach any one of these communities through the city of Anchorage, Alaska, when these roads fail. On the secondary screen, you can see some of the expected takeoff and landing conditions in these rural communities. Frontier will be able to take off from unimproved surfaces using its larger tires and oleo-pneumatic struts. It will be able to take off in ice conditions using its independent thrusting for steering and in water operations using its unique flying boat hull design. These features separate the Northern Elements Any One Frontier from its competitors in the mid-size utility aircraft market. In a 2010 survey conducted between seaplane operators, the need for a mid-size utility aircraft with our specific mission requirements becomes evidently clear. 
42% of seaplane operators indicated a need for an occupancy of between 7 and 15 passengers. 29% of these operators indicated a need for a similar payroll capacity to our RFP requirement. And 20% of these operators indicated a need of a range between 650 and 850 nautical miles. On the primary screen, you can now see the Frontier's direct competitors. There is not a single aircraft in production that can meet our specific mission requirements. In fact, this NASA Grand Caravan 208B needs to be retrofitted with floats in order to meet our operational capabilities. A cost of $50,000 in labor alone and an estimated completion time of two weeks. The Plotus PC-6 Porter Amphibian cannot meet the necessary payload requirements or passenger requirements. And the Antilles G-21 Super Goose cannot meet a single mentioned requirement on the screen. On the secondary screen, you can see some of the interior configurations of our frontier. These configurations include a payload capacity of up to 3,000 pounds of either palleted or loose cargo, up to two litter patients and their accompanying medical personnel, or 12 passengers with stowage. On the primary screen, you can now see the frontier in both its hard landing con takeoff condition and its water takeoff condition. From a hard surface, the Frontier will be able to take off in 4,000 feet, and from a water surface in one nautical mile, clearing a 50-foot obstacle in both cases. On the secondary screen, you can see our mission profile. We will then begin our optimal climb rate of up to 2,000 feet per minute at sea level until we reach our cruising altitude of 18,000 feet and fly within our operational range of 800 nautical miles, or until the pilot begins his descent and landing maneuvers. At this time, if the airstrip is unusable or unable to land, the plane can perform a go-around maneuver in order to find a more suitable landing condition to complete the mission. Our design point was chosen relatively early in the design process in order to tailor the propulsion system and the airframe to meet our specific mission requirements while still retaining a 10% margin of safety from our most constraining factors. These factors were found to be the stall speed, the cruise speed, and the takeoff constraint. On the secondary screen, you can see some of the concluded numbers from this design point, most notably the minimum wing area of 426 square feet and the minimum power required of 1,465 horsepower. Mark Van Bergen will be talking about the preview and aircraft description. Thank you, Jared. My name is Mark Van Bergen, and I'll be going over the preview and aircraft description for the Northern Elements Frontier. On the primary screen above me, you'll see the three view for our aircraft. Our aircraft is a high-mounted monoplane with laterally mounted sponsons and a flying boat hull. You will see that we are a twin-engine design utilizing two high-mounted engines. The high-mounted engines allow us to get the propellers and the inlets out of the spray of water and debris during takeoff and landing. you also notice that we have a tricycle undercarriage that retracts laterally into our sponsons and forward into the nose. We spin two four-bladed 9.3-foot propellers, and we are a mid-size aircraft with a 61-foot wingspan, a 45-foot length, and a 20-foot height. On the secondary screen, you will see some major dimensions and parameters for the NE-1 Frontier. I will now cover the aircraft interior and layout of our aircraft. The NE-1 Frontier has a highly configurable interior that allows the customer to switch missions at a moment's notice. We utilize a rail system that all of our components snap into and out of. Our first configuration is the uh, passenger seating layout. This utilizes 12 foldable aero twin seats um, and can carry a max passengers of 12. Uh, these seats are lightweight, foldable, stowable, and they are FAR certified. You will see a detailed drawing of these on the secondary slide. Our second configuration is the medical transport configuration. The aircraft can utilize two Boucher litter beds, um, which are foldable, stowable, um, and easily configurable on the interior. We also have positions and supplies for up to two attending medical personnel. Uh, the aircraft is pressurized, which means that these attending medical personnel will not need to use oxygen masks as they are attending to our patients. On the secondary screen, you will see detailed pictures of the Boucher litter bed in both its installed and its stowed configuration. Our third configuration is the Frontier's cargo layout. 
Um, the Frontier is capable of carrying 3,000 pounds of cargo in any layout necessary. The large cargo door on the side of the aircraft can accommodate a uh, standard size pallet as well as oil drums. As you can see on the secondary slide, we will utilize a harness and strap system that will attach to our normal uh, rail system in order to secure any payload we may be carrying. I will now discuss the hull design for our flying boat aircraft. As a flying boat aircraft, the hull design is a necessary part of the overall fuselage design of the aircraft. There are three main characteristics for any flying boat hull. There's the stern post angle, which on our aircraft is nine degrees. This dictates how much of the hull is in the water during uh, landing and takeoff. The second characteristic is the step location. On our aircraft, the step is located 17 feet behind the nose of the aircraft. The step is a sharp discontinuity in the hull of the aircraft, which allows the any one frontier to break suction with the water and become airborne. The third defining characteristic is the dead rise angle, which is the angle that the side of our hull makes with the horizontal surface of the water. On our aircraft, this is 30 degrees and it defines how our aircraft rises out of and sinks back into the water on landing. The area highlighted in blue on the primary screen is our submerged volume. Our water line comes to 1.1 feet beneath the sill of the door, and this is at our max takeoff weight configuration of 13,000 pounds. On the secondary screen, you will see a dimension picture of our sponson design. We chose sponsons over wingtip floats because they increase the uh, water maneuverability, reduce the opportunities for ground looping, and they can accommodate our extra large landing gear. As you can see, they're airfoil shaped, which reduces drag. Nick Kearney will now discuss the weight and balance analysis. Thank you, Mark. I'm Nick Kearney, and I'll be going over the weight and balance analysis. The weight and balance analysis was performed by estimating the weights and CG locations of various components of the aircraft. A method from the Raymer text was used to estimate the weight and CG locations of the fuselage, wing, vertical tail, and horizontal tail. For the weight and balance analysis, the x-axis was measured from the nose of the aircraft, the y-axis was measured from the centerline of the aircraft, and the z-axis was measured from the bottom of the wheels. The primary screen now shows some of the components that make up the Frontier's empty weight. The secondary screen shows the remaining components that form the Frontier's empty weight. The empty weight of the Frontier is currently estimated to weigh 7,345 pounds. The primary screen now shows the additional components that will be carried by the Frontier for the passenger configuration. Due to adequate spacing between the seats to provide passenger comfort, this configuration produces the most apt XCG. The secondary screen shows the CG excursion diagram for the pa passenger payload. On this diagram, the x-axis represents the location of the XCG with respect to the mean aerodynamic cord, and the y-axis represents the weight of the aircraft. The location of the aerodynamic center of the aircraft has also been included on this plot to show that the Frontier has a positive 10.1% static margin when flying in the most apt XCG. The primary screen now shows the additional components that will be carried by the Frontier for the cargo configuration. The cargo configuration is expected to be the heaviest payload the Frontier will be capable of transporting and will have a takeoff weight of 13,117 pounds. The secondary screen shows a CG excursion diagram of the cargo configuration. The primary screen now shows the additional components that will be carried by the Frontier for the litter bed configuration. The litter beds were positioned in a staggered manner so that the YCG remains on the aircraft's center line. The secondary screen shows the CG excursion diagram for the litter bed configuration. From the weight and balance analysis, we have determined that the furthest forward XCG is located 175 inches aft of the nose. We have also concluded that the aft XCG, the furthest aft XCG is located 192 inches from the nose of the aircraft. 
These positions can be seen on the secondary screen. I will now go over the empennage design of the Frontier. We have decided to go with the conventional layout for the empennage of the Frontier due to its simplicity and to minimize weight. The primary screen now shows the sizing of the horizontal tail. The horizontal, the horizontal tail has an area of 154 square feet and the elevator makes up 51% of the mean geometric core. The secondary screen shows how the lift produced by the horizontal tail changes due to a 20 degree elevator deflection. The primary screen now shows the sizing of the vertical tail. The vertical tail has an area of 54.9 square feet and the rudder makes up 48% of the mean geometric core. The secondary screen shows how the side force produced by the vertical tail changes due to a rudder deflection angle of 15 degrees. Next, Jayanth Bangalore will go over the wing design of the Frontier. Thank you, Nick. My name is Jayanth Bangalore, and I'll be going over the wing design of the Frontier. The versatile role of the Frontier requires an, F an FY that produces high lift. Therefore, on the primary screen, you can see that we chose the NACA 23012 f foil that produces a CL max of 1.79 and has a high stall angle of 18 degrees. On the secondary screen is the cross-sectional uh, area of the f foil. On the primary screen is the Katia wing sketch of the frontier. The semi-span of the wing is 30 feet and 5 inches and the root cord is 9 feet. On the secondary screen is the wing design parameters. The aspect ratio is at 8.48 and the wing has a planform area of 427 square feet. The wing has no incidence or dihedral angles. On the primary screen are the 2D and the 3D lift curve slopes. On the secondary screen are the lift curve slope parameters. When the airfoil is converted to wing, the CL max decreases to 1.61 and the stall angle increases to 19.2 degrees. On the primary screen is a design of the ailerons and this is shown in the Katia animation on the primary screen. The ailerons are 30% of the mean cord and 23% of the wingspan is covered by ailerons. And on the secondary screen is a design of the flaps. 30% of the mean cord and 56% of the wingspan is covered by the flaps. On the primary screen is a lift curve slope of the clean wing, the wing with a 15 degree deflection and a wing with a 30 degree flap deflection. On the secondary screen are the CL values obtained with the flap deflection. During the takeoff configuration we require a CL of 1.8 and we get a CL of 1.92 with a 15 degree flap deflection. And during landing we require a CL of 2 and we get a CL of 2.11 with a flap deflection of 30 degrees. Now I will be going over the structural design of the Frontier. To be noted that the uh, structural design of the Frontier was done based on similar aircraft studies done by Roskam and adapted according to the specifics of the Frontier. On the primary screen is the structural sizing of the wing. <coughs> Two I-beams run as spars. Uh, the forward spar is at 30% and the rear spar is at 68% of the wing cord and the ribs are placed 30 inches apart from each other. On the secondary screen is the structural sizing of the empennage. The forward spar is at 25% and the rear spar is at 70% of the horizontal tail cord and the ribs are placed 25 inches apart from each other. On the primary screen is the structural sizing of the fuselage. The frames are at a depth of 1.5 inches and are spaced 30 inches from each other. And the longerons, which run from the nose of the aircraft to the aft of the aircraft, are spaced 15 inches from each other. On the secondary screen is the uh, one of the most important structural components of the Frontier when it is on water. The sponsons are made of two large I-beams, which run underneath the floor of the aircraft, and the ribs are airfoil shaped. On the primary screen is the ghost view of the aircraft with the fuselage, empennage, the wing, and the sponson structure assembled together. The structure of the frontier depicts a, uh, excuse me, depicts a 
semi-monocoque design in which the skin bears the most of the load and the secondary structures such as bulkheads and the frames uh, support the skin. The frontier will have, a will have a total of two doors, the first being the cargo door which is on the left aft of the aircraft. It's a single door that opens on side hinges, it is 50 inches wide and 50 inches high. On the secondary screen is the passenger door of the frontier which is also an air stair. It opens downwards on lower hinges. It is 30 inches wide and 50 inches high. For the structure of the frontier, we decided aluminum to be a desired material since it has a high strength to weight ratio and it is resistant to corrosion and is also easy to fabricate. A total of two alloys were chosen to be applied on the materials. The aluminum 7075T6 alloy, which has a high fracture toughness, was chosen to be applied on the skin and the aluminum 7068 alloy, which has a high tensile strength, will be used on the spars, ribs, longerons, stringers, and high load bearing fittings. Now Sergio Perez will discuss the propulsion selection. Thank you, Jaden. My name is Sergio Perez, and I'll be going over Northern Elements proposing selection. On the primary screen is the turboprop Pan Windy PT6A-60, Northern Elements decided to go with a turboprop due to its high performance at high altitudes as opposed to a piston engine and its high fuel efficiency as opposed to a jet engine. On the secondary screen, you can see the variants for the PT6A. The Dash 60 was chosen due to its high thrust output and efficient SFC. Now, the primary screen is a fuel usage for the particular engine. The taxi, takeoff, climb, descent, and landing were found using a method that incorporated the percentage of power for a particular phase the time duration for a particular phase, and the engine SFC. The crews are found using the Briquette range equation. The highlighted values are the total fuel usage for a particular configuration, and um, with the cargo being the most due to being the heaviest. The secondary screen is the engine configuration. There we have a four-bladed variable pitch propeller. The four-blade is chosen due to its competitive climb rate as opposed to a three-blade. The variable pitch allows the pilot to adjust the angles of the propeller so that it sees the maximum amount of airflow, thus allowing the propeller to perform at maximum efficiency. The engine will also operate using counter-rotating blades to account for the torque produced by both engines. It will also be feathering capable to allow for a reduction in drag in the event of an engine failure. The uh, reverse thrusting capabilities aid performance upon landing. Now shown on the primary screen is the power available plot. The values found for this plot were found using a method that incorporated a model from Dr. Manley for turboprop engines. The model incorporated the static thrust, altitude, and velocity. As shown on the plot, the power does decrease with altitude, but simultaneously increases with velocity. We do experience a power loss of 57% at a cruising altitude of 18,000 feet. Now I will go over the drive polar analysis. Shown on the primary screen is a drag holder at sea level. This was found using the, drag, the Raymer's drag build-up method. The pressure and induced drag were found using the lifting surfaces such as the wing, horizontal tail, and sponsons. The skin friction was found using the wetted surface areas seen on the secondary screen. Now we arrive to power available versus power power plots. The primary screen shows about the values found at sea level. Here, our maximum operating velocity is 224 knots and with a subsequent piece of S of 2,050 feet per minute. On the secondary screen, you can see the values for 18,000 feet, where our maximum operating velocity is 204 knots, with a subsequent piece of S of 400 feet per minute. Finally, we get to the constant specific excess power plots. The contours shown show the range from 2,000 feet per minute down to zero feet per minute, which defines our absolute ceiling of 21,570 feet, and our secondary screen shows our service ceiling of 20,650 feet. I'd now like to introduce Blake Bradford for stability and control. Thank you, Sergio. My name is Blake Bradford, and I'll be going over the stability and control analysis. On the primary screen is the static margin X plot, where the staple region is to the right of the intersection of the aerodynamic center and center of gravity trend lines. The recommended value for this is 10%. Where for our most apt CG configuration and a horizontal tail area of 154 square feet, 
The Frontier has a static margin of 10.1%. On the secondary screen is a CN beta X plot, where the stable region is above the black horizontal line. The recommended value for this is 0 0.001 per degree, where for a vertical tail area of 54.9 square feet, we have a CN beta of 0.0014. Now, one of the main criteria for stability control analysis is for the frontier to be statically stable. On the primary screen are the static stability derivatives for the frontier, as well as their known sign conventions. And by the values on the screen, the frontier meets those standards. Now, for the verification of the espionage performance, Northern Elements conducted an analysis in order to find the frontier's rotate velocity. On the primary screen are the forces and distances that create the rotating moment about the main landing gear. Uh, for a land takeoff, we have a rotate speed of 94 knots. And you can compare this to the stall speed on the secondary screen. Now, we will also rotate at an angle of 9.6 degrees and this will prevent a tail strike during land operations and a submerged horizontal tail during water operations. For a water takeoff, the frontier will rotate about its center of gravity, thus making this rotate velocity decrease. However, for a conservative value, we use 94 knots in all analyses. Now, since the frontier is a twin-engine aircraft, Northern Elements conducted a minimum controlled velocity analysis for a one-engine out scenario. On the primary screen are the forces and distances that create the yaw moment due to the one engine out scenario. Uh, the minimum control speed for an, a rudder deflection of 15 degrees, we have a minimum control speed of 69 knots. And you can compare this to the rotate and stall speeds on the secondary screen. Now since the minimum control speeds below both the rotate and stall speeds, the pilot has directional control over the aircraft during all phases of flight. I will now cover the performance verification analysis. On the primary screen are the takeoff distances for the various surfaces the Frontier was designed for. Each hard surface takeoff distance was calculated using Raymer's ground roll equation, uh, various friction coefficients for each surface, as well as a 50-foot object at the end of the runway and a 15-degree flap deflection. For a water surface takeoff, we used Raymer's friction coefficient to assume hydrodynamic drag. The water surface takeoff is the longest distance at 3,140 feet. The RFP requires that the frontier take off less than 4,000 feet on a hard surface and, six, and one nautical mile on a water surface. And the frontier meets those criteria for each uh, takeoff condition. On the secondary screen is the landing performance calculations. This time assuming a 50 foot object at the beginning of the runway as well as a 30 degree flap deflection. The longest distance for this is the ice runway at 1,330 feet. RFP requirements are similar to those of the takeoff and the frontier meets those criteria for each surface. On the primary screen is the range performance for the frontier. This was calculated using a combination of the endurance and of, of the Breguet endurance and range equations. Uh, and for flying at an altitude of 18,000 feet in the heaviest cargo configuration at a cruise speed of 167 knots, we have a maximum range of 879 nautical miles, in addition to having 45 minutes of fuel reserves. If you look at the range versus payload diagram, you also see that the Frontier can travel over 1,150 nautical miles if it does not carry any cargo. The RFP requires that the Frontier carry or travel 800 nautical miles, and FAR dictates a, a fuel reserve of 45 minutes, both of which the Frontier meets. On the secondary screen is the flight envelope, where the Q limit will extend out to 500 knots at an altitude of 18,000 feet, and the upper and lower G limits are defined by FAR 23 weight requirements. Up next will be Alexander Vladika, who will go over landing gear design. Thank you, Blake. My name is Alexander Vladika, and I'll be testing landing gear design choices and criteria. 
But looking at the primary screen, you can see a Katia animation of the primary landing gear retracting into the sponsons laterally and the nose gear retracting into the hole forward. We chose a tricycle configuration for our landing gear because it, it resisted a nose down pitching moment that is caused by the high mountain engines. Additionally, this type of configuration gave the pilot better, better ground visibility during ground operations. On the primary screen, you can now see the static load calculations for the main gear and nose gear. On the second gear screen, you can see the selected uh, appropriate tire selections for the main and nose gear. For the main tire, we'll have a tire size of 32 by 11 inches, and for the nose, we'll have a, a tire size of 24 by 11 inches. We selected an oil pneumatic shock absorber for our, our landing gear because of its reliability and long-term operating life cycle. We used Raymer's technique to calculate the <coughs> shock stroke diameter and shock stroke length as seen on the primary screen. For longitudinal temporal criteria, the recommended angle between the main gear and the most FCG is to be greater than 15 degrees. On the primary screen, you can see that aircraft does satisfy this criteria by being at 17 degrees. On the secondary screen, you can see the lateral tip over criteria. This criteria helps prevent tip over during ground operations. The recommended angle is to be less than 62 degrees, and our aircraft satisfies this condition by being at 61 degrees. For longitudinal ground clearance, the recommended angle between the main gear and the tail of the wing, the tail, <coughs> tail of the aircraft, is to be greater than 15 degrees. This is to help prevent a tail strike during takeoff. Additionally, you can see that on the primary screen, the angle is from the wheel, so if a flat tire does occur during ground operations, we still meet this criteria. On the secondary screen, you can see that <coughs> the lateral ground clearance. This angle is to help prevent the, uh, the tip of the wing hitting the ground during landings. The recommended angle is to be greater than five degrees, and our angle, <coughs> and the, the angle for us is uh, 24 degrees. Additionally, the angle from the sponsons during uh, water operations it also meets the criteria by being at 12 degrees. Additional landing on asphalt, the anyone frontier, anyone frontier will be capable of landing on ice, water, and unpaved surfaces. When landing on ice, the anyone frontier will use its reverse thrust capabilities in place of brakes and will have uh, independent throttle control and aid, aid of steering. During water landings, the anyone frontier will land on its hull and it will have its sponsors will support the lateral stability of, of the aircraft. During unpaved surfaces, we'll have large tires with low PSI to enable the aircraft to overcome large, to enable the aircraft to overcome rough terrains. And we'll have an oil pneumatic shock absorber to help, in, help with the impact of the landing. Next, I will discuss the cost analysis of the anyone frontier. On the primary screen, you can see some of the components we researched for the anyone frontier. These components are such as research and development, manufacturing acquisition, and the operating cost. During operations, the aircraft will uh, be estimated to cost, uh, is estimated to uh, be $801 per flight hour. On the primary screen, you can now see the operations cost, life cycle cost, and airplane estimated price. On the secondary screen, you can see our competitors' uh, listed prices. Although the N1 Frontier is more expensive than our competitors, it is a multi-utility aircraft that is capable of reaching remote locations and having inter inter interchangeable interiors and without having to modify its structural airframe. Our competitors cannot meet our, all of our RFP requirements, but for that reason, the N1 Frontier is competitive in the current market. Next, I will pa pass it on to Chad Berg on labor and cost accounting. Thank you, Alexander. I'll now be discussing labor and cost accounting. On the primary screen, the graph compares our projected hours versus our actual hours worked on this project. I was able to determine the projected hours by making the assumption that each team member would spend two hours outside of class for every one hour spent in class. This resulted in a total project hours of 1,672. We are currently 39% over our projected hours. The secondary slide shows a breakdown of the hours spent on each category. This shows that engineering consumed more of our time than any other category, but it is followed closely by administrative and professional development. 
The primary screen now shows the numerical values for the labor hour and cost accumulation to date. This shows that we have spent over $50,500 on engineering, and we have spent in total 2,328 hours on this project. <coughs> this corresponds to just over $113,800. The secondary slide now shows the breakdown of the cost spent on each category. This shows that engineering consumed 44% of our costs due to labor hours, which is more than the other categories by a margin. <coughs> I will now discuss conclusions and recommendations. From our similar aircraft studies, it was determined that in order for the Frontier to be competitive in the marketplace, it must have an easily configurable interior. This will be achieved by implementing a rail system that will allow the Frontier's interior to change with its mission, whether that be carrying 12 passengers, 3,000 pounds of cargo, or two litter patients. From the propulsion analysis in conjunction with the drag puller, we were able to conclude that our engine selection provides sufficient power to obtain a competitive climb rate of 2,050 feet per minute at sea level and a service ceiling of 20,650 feet. Both of these values were calculated in our heaviest configuration. From the weight and balance analysis, we were able to conclude that our heaviest configuration would be the cargo configuration and that our most confining configuration for stability and control would be the passenger configuration since it produced the most aft center of gravity. From the stability and control analysis, we were able to determine that the Frontier is statically stable and it possesses a static margin of 10.1% in the most confining configuration. We were also able to, to, to determine that the minimum control speed is safe. We determined the speed was safe because it is below not only the rotate speed, but it is below the stall speed at sea level. This means that the pilots of the Frontier will never be in a situation where they are not able to maintain directional control of the aircraft in the event of an engine failure. Northern Elements would like to recommend that the Northern Utility aircraft that we were tasked with engineering emulate the figures shown on the primary and secondary screen. Northern Elements would like to recommend that we perform computational and exper experimental analysis of the frontier in order to compare it with our theoretical values obtained during the preliminary design process. This concludes our presentation. I will initially field any questions. We'll now, now take questions from the panel. Okay. Um, guys, this is really, really polished. Um, it's almost too polished. <laughs> you were, it didn't seem like there was any room for any kind of off color or not even not even off script remarks. So, uh, I mean, it's obvious you put a lot into this preparation for this presentation. The package was really good. The graphics were very, very well done. Um, I hope some of my class are in here. <laughs> they're, pro they're probably sleeping right now. <laughs> But uh, anyway, you guys did a really good job on this. I do have some comments uh, that I'd like to share with you guys. Good and, and areas for improvement. Uh, going from the back here, uh, the wrap-up was excellent. A very good conclusion and wrap-up summary of the technical performance and recommendations. I thought was really, really well done. If you go back to slide 68A, I don't know if you guys have control of that, the cumin projected labor hours. Um, there's a deviation there. and. Um, wondering what you could tell me about that. First of all, root cause of that, and what would you do to fix it from here on out? Because if this program continues on, you'd have to kind of either come back online or adjust your forecast. Uh, so, and then also I'd like to see what your recommendations are if you had to do this over again and forecast this from the beginning. All right, thank you for that. We decided to take the approach that this was an academic experience and we wanted to get the most out of that. So our team made the decision early on that we were gonna put forth as much effort as we could into this project. And it became fun, and it wasn't as much work. So a lot of the members, I think, can attest to the fact that we enjoyed working on this project. And we were able to see results from our hard work. And so once that trend started, it continued. And so for an academic setting, I feel that this is a positive outcome. I don't feel that we jeopardize any of our other classes too bad. Uh, I, I, 
we did take breaks, as you can notice. We had a Thanksgiving break there where we decided to eat. Uh, so I would say, uh, to, if I had to do it again, I, I personally would not change a thing, and I, I think I can speak for the team in saying that. At those, those same slides, I'm curious, uh, as a business owner, the stuff that you show here is pretty cool in that it says overhead. <laughs> and that's usually what we try to control. Um, the slide was at 68B, you know, you, you'd estimated it, the ministry would have been, I mean, a huge chunk and had to be less. Can you kind of explain why you thought it would be so high and why it came in so low? How, can I explain how the, uh, so the- Your estimate, how did you come up with your estimate? So these were actual hours that we logged weekly and they were compartmentalized. So this is the breakdown, this, the slide shown currently is the breakdown of the hours. Okay, that spent. wasn't an estimate initially, no, that's, that's how it really broke down. That's the hours and then the second slide, uh, the, the following one shows the breakdown of the cost. Okay. So there are different uh, labor hours right. uh, for whether it be engineering. And that's why there's such a discontinuity here, why engineering consumes more cost, even though significantly more cost, even though it wasn't that significant. What, what took so much of the administrative? Uh, so we've, we've written uh, three reports at this point with our, our final report in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of administrative process in editing those. And uh, compiling them, we considered the initial draft was considered engineering, and then the edits made beyond that were administrative, uh, as well as the edits to the, the presentations. In the real world, it'd probably be dealing with FAA and the government and everything. It'd be a hell of a lot more than that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to uh, 56A. So. When I was looking at the slide, I'm thinking, okay, what's the requirement? And it would really be nice to see the requirement on the slide just so I could make that comparison like on the, on the spot. Absolutely, thank so, you for so that. I think that'd be good. Um, be advised that all of your performance numbers now are on your preliminary design. Your airplane's gonna get fatter and it's gonna get draggier <laughs> in detail. And so you wanna have margin in your performance numbers at this point because it's only gonna erode from here. So. What's our goal? Yeah, like margin, what you need, because you, know, you said it was going to be dragging your pattern. Is there a, let's look at that. Well, I'm asking you too. And a lot of these. What well, about these guys? You know, <laughs> as Pro Professor Zwick said, on some of these, you know, you guys actually did put, here's the goal we met. Here's the margin we met. Right. Some of them, it was buried in there. Um, and as he said, and we just put it right in front. It just, you know, just primarily because guys like me tend to get lost. I'm like, okay, I gotta go back to that in the last slide I put the two together. Um, but my question, I, I keep asking him, it's like, all right, he say it's gonna get, these are good numbers, but it's gonna get dragging and fatter. Is there any kind of a number, like a margin that you should be working towards that you would know of? So we, have, we do not have a specific margin. We have been conservative throughout every estimate. Um, so we continue, we, we figured from the beginning that making conservative estimates on our weight would pay off, and it proved to. Um, we initially were not a pressurized aircraft, and we were conservative enough with our weight that we were able to pressurize our aircraft without redesigning. So we hope that that same mentality moving forward into detail uh, will yield the same results. So you're re relying on the conservatism of all your analyses, so it won't be as in his terms, <laughs> had to keep using a drag here in fact. Right, <laughs> right, and if, if you notice, our, uh, when we compared our, our landing distances to our requirements, we do have a very good margin there to work with, so we are very confident that we'll be able to still meet our requirements in detail. Okay. Uh, briefly go to 51A. I just love that format. You guys have your derivatives, the values, the stability criteria, and your outcome, green checkbox, it's like, yeah. Really clear. Uh, I like the I like the format. Um, let's look at uh, 40A. Aluminum material selection. Uh, you've got easy fabrication. Has anybody thought about how you're going to assemble the ribs and the spars? What's your method of, of doing the attachment there? I will. Uh, I'll defer that question to our uh, our structures. Okay. So. Um, for this phase of the design process, um, we were tasked to do the structural sizing and the locations. So uh, our, uh, we did not, uh, we were not tasked to look at look into the um, the sizing or like the manufacturing aspect of it. So once we go to um, detail, we'll be looking at that and then also analyzing 
the loads and uh, and the failure criteria. Okay. All right. Thank you. Fair enough. Uh, let's see. Has your weight estimate been updated to reflect the structure? So let's look at, say, for instance, 37A. I know initial weights generally are are done using Roskin's methods, where you're basically doing a statistical proportion. Have you gone to the uh, to the effort of going updating your weight estimate based on the structures you guys have designed? I will defer that to uh, Nick. He's he's the best member to answer. <laughs> So current, um, going off of what Jay said too, we currently have not updated our weight estimation based on our actual structure design. Um, in detail, when we further develop our structural design, we will then go back and update our weights for the structure of the frontier. Okay. I'm gonna hand off to your design. This is oh, my turn. Turn. So, I'm just right. gonna, because I know it's preliminary, but. One thing I didn't see were any like basic CAM calculations that would say that the ribs, everything was about adequately sized. I mean, heck, you could have just cut the fuselage and had that didn't have silver rights. Right? Well, <laughs> very little, you know, very little stress. Um, how confident are you guys with this design? Is it based off of something out of a book that's like this is the standard spacing for? That's pretty much what it is. Yes, so that it, it's based off of uh, our text that compares similar aircraft. So at this point, it's a preliminary structural design. Yeah, and. Uh, it's, it's preliminary, meaning it, we do need to refine it in detail, but this is our starting point of this should be a sufficient place to at least start from. Yeah, refined or not, though, it's almost like, uh, you know, everything else you had, numbers, uh -huh. gate margins, it couldn't hurt for this. Okay, thank Primarily you. Primarily because I'm sitting here like, okay, I'm an investor, this is cool, these guys covered everything. Is it gonna crack in the air? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it does look adequate, but a few numbers would have been pretty cool. Absolutely. We could have said we designed it for, you know, we looked at it for ultimate, we looked at it for limit. Here are the loads. Here's you know, quick hand calculation that says like the margin's ten or something ridiculous. Thank you for that. Yeah, we'll we'll address that moving forward. Yeah, along those lines, I think you guys have enough information to create the end diagram so you can actually do some of those rough load counts. Uh, uh, let's go to slide ten. <laughs> <laughs> it has to put gust lines on it. <laughs> Forbidden. <laughs> oh, you'll have you'll have fun with my class. My class. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, uh, 21B. Uh, okay, there we go, on the right there. Uh, really like this, I thought that was really well done. Uh, as I was looking at it though, I'm thinking, what else could we put on there? And uh, one of the things that kind of alluded to with one of our team's comments was, what's a good range of margin? Uh, so that would be helpful there. And then also, where does the landing gear sit? Because, boy, landing gear tip over could be easy to show on this as well uh, for the landing gear on there. So, those are two pieces of information. But really, I like the chart. I thought you guys put it together well, and it's really, really clear. God, I wish my class was really good. <laughs> Some really good stuff. So, uh, let's see. Look at uh, 19B. Uh, we're in a weight and balance section here. <coughs> weight and balance follows. Uh, it would be nice to show on that slide, you know, where your zero reference point was for the fuselage station, and then also where the CG is, and then basically the weight of the airplane. Yeah, thank you for that, though. So, we'll address that. Yeah, it's, as well. ba it's very basic stuff. You know, it's something you're going to get whenever you do a report, so that the guy just doesn't have a question. It might seem repetitive to you, but it really comes in handy. Um, as Professor Zwick said, if you would have put just those things up there, or, it, it is kind of clear, but it doesn't make the perfect connection. Thank you for that. So let's see, uh, hull design on 17A. A uh, question came to mind there. Uh, how, do you, how do you design a hull for water landing? Have you guys thought of any of the structural analysis that needs to be done for that? And how confident are you that this hull is going to work for your application? So Mark Van Bergen is our hull expert. I'm going to defer this question to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> kind of capable team here. Um, so we did do an analysis, of, or I mean, not a full in-depth analysis, but we did strengthen the uh, structure on the hull, um, and as well, we also included bulkheads in the structure of the hull um, in order to keep the uh, compartments watertight, um, so that if there is a puncture in the hull, in case we strike a rock or you know a log or something on the water, um, the aircraft will still be able to float without. It. Is there an industry rule of thumb for that? 
I, I don't know. I don't know. Industry rules of thumb for hull design. I was, I was a ground and boost design in hull design. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. I've never really been this way. Wow. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, your passenger seating, uh, 13B, has got a, got a picture of a seat. And I looked at that and I thought, well, it's probably meets your weight requirements, but is it really comfortable to sit in? <laughs> how, long, how long do I have to endure sitting on that seat? <laughs> so we, we are a utility aircraft, and what we strive to do is be mission ready for our three different missions we mentioned of carrying 12 passengers, 3,000 pounds of cargo, cargo, or carrying two litter patients. What this seat allows us to do is to fold it up and sit it in the back, pull out our stowable litter bed, and complete, just change our mission, you know, whether it was planned or not, we could land to a remote village and unload our cargo and then all of a sudden realize we need to take a sick patient out. These seats allow us to change that configuration at a moment's notice. So, so comfort wasn't your primary goal, it's more like <laughs> mission Correct. adaptability on the Absolutely. Fly, right? These are sufficiently safe and they're far certified. Okay, got it, got it, okay. All right. I think I'm getting close to the end of my comments, guys. So really, congratulations on a, on a well done presentation. Uh, very, very clean. I really like the organization. Nice job. So. Thank you very much. I don't know why I'm I've just been going on for years. Okay. Yeah. It was very nice. Thank you. And if you bring the cost down, the investors will love you again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> it was all the cost of never cheap. <laughs> You know, I told those guys that I've already asked all of my questions when they were doing their practice. But since we have time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you missed that on your contract. Uh, we have just a second. If anybody has a burning question from the audience. That's <laughs> great. Why is the, the door on the right? <laughs> there, there are some questions that are forbidden. <laughs> Would you like me to respond? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, <laughs> they, they do an answer. Yeah, initially, we designed this, this aircraft and we wanted to, to utilize the cargo door for both, for both the uh, loading cargo as well as fitting an air stair to the cargo door so that we could get the passengers through the same door. We later, uh, later in the design process decided that it would be more convenient to have an air stair. And since the cargo door was the initial door, it's placed on the left side, we, we have put the air stair on the right side. Uh, moving, forward, moving forward with our design, if we determine that that is not sufficient for any reason, we, are, we do have the capability to, to reverse those doors. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Since, uh, I, I can yell out. Since your cost analysis showed that you were fairly expensive, do you want, do you want to explain your, where, where that came from? I mean, I assume it's just a Raymer or a Roscom kind of That's, cover. It is a, a Raymer Roscom method. Um, well, actually, I believe it was Roscom, correct? Right. So it, it was a Roscom method that we, we utilized. Uh, it's we, we did our best to provide the best cost analysis that we could with the information that we had available. There are certain things in the preliminary design phase, uh, there's just specifics that we don't have access to. So we, we made our best uh, judgment and moved forward with that. So our cost analysis does reflect that it's more expensive. Uh, it's also a larger aircraft than the, the similar aircraft. Our, our request for proposal was asking for an aircraft that, that doesn't exist. So that there's really nothing in that niche. So we are filling a new void. Uh, the, the reason our aircraft, our similar aircraft, are similar is because that's what's currently being used in our areas. Since you do have different capabilities, is there a way to change the, the measure to be a cost per passenger mile or something? So that Absolutely. You could, yes, we can we can show look your advantage. Uh, yes, that, I really appreciate that. That'll give us uh, maybe a way to present it in the future uh, to where it. It drives the message home that we can do more than any of our competitors. And did you have a really conservative estimate for the number of aircraft you were going to base this upon? For each so year? we based it upon having two uh, aircraft for uh, research and development, and we had 50, a 50-unit 50 uh, purchase to our, our clientele.
And is that a reasonable compared to your competitors? How many uh, how many competitor airplanes are out there? Uh, that's that's a number I'm not personally familiar with. The Mark Van Bergen, I will I'll defer that question. <laughs> Um, I don't know the exact numbers on each of them, but uh, the Cessna Grand Caravan produces about a hundred a year, um, and then the other compar or the other comparable aircraft are similar in that. So it sounds like fifty unit total is pretty low. That's so per our request for proposal, we had to make an aircraft that was affordable for a fifty unit purchase. Ah. So it only gets better as we sell more. <laughs> <laughs> So when you're selling it to the investor down yeah. there, that I will sell more than you, 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 you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. These guys are salesmen. They can sell. The door. <laughs> if they can sell the door being on the other side, they can sell me. <laughs> okay, guys. Thank you very much.